Uh, thank you, and morning, everyone. I'm going to be speaking about, well, I'm speaking on conversing with people living in poverty. And before we really get into the talk, I want to kind of bring your attention to some of the words used in the title of the talk. So I, I really just want to highlight a few things because words are important. Um, and especially in if you're trying to do good, you really have to guard against um, sort of preconceived notions or slightly lazy thinking. Um, it's, yeah, if you're trying to do good, you have to be careful not to kind of, to do bad. Um, we also all come with sort of preconceived ideas and our own sort of cultural baggage. And it's really, there is an onus on us to own that and um, to, to accept it and, and, and work with it. I mean, it's, it's only human. So um, conversing, this is really, if you're going to reach out to people living, with, living in poverty, Oh, um, did we just lose the, the mic? Maybe I just need to lean a bit closer. Um, if you're going to be reaching out to people, you really want to make sure you're thinking of it as a conversation. This is not a one way we're educating people. It's not a one way we know what's right and we're telling poor people what to do. Um, we're really learning from them as much as they're learning from us and it really needs to be, to be a dialogue. Um, and we'll get to a bit more on that later. Um, the next word I really want to highlight is people. Um, it's very easy to become kind of obsessed with the differences between oneself and the people one is helping. Um, and those differences are important. But at the same time, there's, we sort of share a common humanity. And it's important not to lose sight of that. I mean, these people that you're helping, they have lives, dreams, families, aspirations. Um, and it's tempting to kind of think as sort of um, ourselves as sort of middle cl class people who are already kind of reaching out as in some sense being better. I mean, certainly we have more money, usually we're better educated, um, but I think it would be really a mistake to think of ourselves as better humans. Um, and lastly, just the phrase living in poverty. Um, I try to avoid speaking of people as, as poor, which makes it sound like being poor is some sort of innate condition. Um, living in poverty really highlights that um, poverty is a circumstance that people happen to find themselves in rather than something that they are. Cool, so just a quick introduction to me and um, I work for a nonprofit called Prekelt. We operate throughout Africa um, we also have um, one employee in India and one in London. Uh, there are about 50 of us in total. I'm the lead engineer on Vumi, which is our messaging platform. <coughs> um, there are currently three developers, um, and recently we've hired one more, so there are now four. Um, I haven't actually met him yet because his first day was on M Monday and I was here. <laughs> and yeah, um, so we're not a, a big team, um, but we're already trying to make a difference. So Vumi is a, a text messaging system, just so that you kind of know what it is. So it's an engine for moving text messages around. Um, I sometimes like to tell people that we write IRC bots to help people. Um, and I think really we're kind of on the cusp of seeing chatbots become a, a really major thing. Um, instant messaging networks have really taken off. Um, if you see someone using their phone, there's a good chance that they're chatting to people over text. Um, and there's, we haven't really seen um, kind of chatbots taking off yet. Um, yeah, so Vumi, it's a text messaging system. It's really designed to reach out to those living in poverty. And really, we're aiming to reach massive scale, like whole countries worth of people, um, because we really want to have a, a big in impact. Um, I also, I, I like to think that kind of we're trying to build infrastructure. So a lot of nonprofits do cool projects, um, but which are in the end kind of really small. And at some point, if you're really going to transform society, what you're doing has to become a kind of infrastructure. Um, our Python is our 
primary language that we, we write Lumi in. And we use Twisted um, have, for pretty much everything. Oh, um, so this is the UN definition of poverty. Um, so poverty is a lack of basic capacity to participate effectively in society. And I really like this definition because rather than highlighting a lack of money, it really highlights people's isolation. And um, you, it's pretty hard for us today to imagine quite how disconnected people can be both from each other and from the society that they're meant to be a, a part of. Um, yeah, we'll get to that a bit more in a minute. So this is Africa. Uh, this is where we do most of our work. Um, the dots are places where we've done projects and where we have connectivity to mobile network operators. So um, places like Libya, Nigeria, Kenya, um, South Africa, where, where I'm from. So just some things about Africa. Um, it's pretty big. Um, it's 30 million square kilometers physically. That's roughly three times the size of Europe um, and three quarters of the size of Asia. There's a billion people, so um, about a third more than they are in Europe. Um, obviously, they're a bit more spread out. Um, yeah, but a lot, obviously a lot smaller than Asia, which is about 4 billion. Um, and there's more than a thousand languages. Um, so, yeah, um, really, if you want to work across Africa, you've, and I mean, I guess it's the same in Europe, you really have to be kind of, um, you have to take care of localization and internationalization. Um, and even just in South Africa, we have 11 official languages. Um, in practice, we only have two languages of languages of record, um, but in theory, any citizen can ask the government to interact with them in their home language if it's one of the 11 official ones. So I'd like you to, well, I'd like to kind of go back in time a bit to 1994, which wasn't all that long ago, um, 20 years. I was just finishing school, so I guess I was already an adult in many ways. Um, in 1994, Nigeria had 100 million people, um, but only 100,000 landlines. So if you think about that, that's one telephone per thousand people. Um, and probably most of those telephones were owned by kind of richer people. So you can imagine just 20 years ago, people living in rural Nigeria might never have made a phone call or probably never had made a phone call. Um, and you can probably, if you try, imagine how isolating that is. And if you have, say, a service delivery problem, say your water isn't working, um, who do you tell? Um, you don't have a phone. You probably don't even know, even if you did have a phone, you wouldn't necessarily know who to call. The nearest government official might be, say, 500 kilometers away. And um, it's not like there's great public transport um, to get you there. So when things are going wrong, it's very hard to reach out and tell someone. Um, and this is really kind of, yes, I mean, it's really kind of drives home. It's a, the problem is more isolation than lack of money. And the problem goes the other way too. Imagine if you're an elected official in a country where your constituents have no way of getting hold of you, um, and where collecting information is hard. Like, how can you serve the people that you've been elected to serve if just finding out anything about them is is hard? Yeah, and well, no surprise, um, there was no internet access in Nigeria in 1994. Um, in fact, even in South Africa, it was well, really pretty much unheard of. Um, let's, well, so actually, one, 
but another thing. So 1994 was a very exciting year for one, one reason. The first mobile phone network launched in Africa. Oh, um, I should say that the most popular phone in 1994 um, weighed half a kilogram and cost about $2,000. So let's fast forward a bit, um, some 18 years to 2012, so two years ago. Suddenly there's 65% mobile penetration on average in Africa. So roughly 65% of people suddenly have a telephone, which is quite an improvement from one in a thousand. Um, in places like Uganda, we see incredible statistics like there are more mobile phones in Uganda than light bulbs. Um, yeah. um, and they really actually are getting good use out of their mobile phones. Um, UNICEF Uganda ran quite a famous project called U-Report, which is, it is a citizen kind of sort of liquid democracy program where you can sign up as a member of U-Report and you can submit feedback kind of directly to your government and they can ask you questions. Um, yeah, and really what we're seeing now in Africa is a kind of mobile generation. So you and I might have, have laptops that we kind of carry around with us everywhere and that we run our lives on. Um, and probably we also have a smartphone as um, a second device. Um, the people, young people in Africa really are their mobile phones are their laptops, they are their offices, they're how they socialize, they're how they do business. Yeah, um, and by contrast to 1994, we're now seeing $20 phones which have internet access, they have SMS, they have USSD, they have instant messaging. Um, also just economically, um, Africa is growing, um, the continent's averaging 5% GDP growth, um, which is pretty good going. Um, the population of Africa is still very young. More than 50% of Africans are less than 20. So, um, at that point, Prekelt had been mostly a consulting company and the rise of kind of mobile phones um, is, was, well, really, we saw this as an opportunity to reach out to people. So we started doing small projects um, to, in the, the social space, and one of the earliest of those was TextAlert. So TextAlert is really just a simple system to remind people of their clinic visits. So I'm sure you know about um, HIV. I'm not sure how many people know about tuberculosis, TB. Well, so typically in Africa, if you, or certainly in South Africa, if you die of, from HIV, what actually kills you is tuberculosis. Um, and tuberculosis is a kind of a, a very bad chest infection is how it manifests. And tuberculosis is very curable. You need to take a course of antibiotics. But unfortunately, for various reasons, people um, don't finish their antibiotic courses, forget to, to go follow, to take follow-up visits, um, or if they're being treated with antiretrovirals for HIV, they kind of forget to go to the clinics for checkups and things. And text alert was just a system which sent people a reminder, kind of a few days before their visit, saying, "Hey, um, you have an appointment at the clinic. Um, if you can't make it, just reply and let us know." And that dropped the number of people who were missing their clinic visits from about 35%. Um, to about 15%. So that was really a big success for us and made us want to do more. However, it wasn't all plain sailing um, and we learned a lot from projects like TextAlert. And one of the things that we learned was that if you're going to be doing a lot of projects, it's important to have reusable software because otherwise you're rewriting things every time. And it's easy to accidentally make things not reusable. So with something like TextAlert, you need to integrate with a mobile network operator or an aggregator who connects you to the cell phone network. And they all have special interfaces which are unique snowflakes. 
and it's easy to accidentally tie your application to something which is really network specific. So you, they might give you a unique identifier and you start relying on that. And then you change to a different network operator who doesn't give you this identifier. And suddenly you have to re-architect your application. So we really want to, we're struggling with reusability. Um, the other, the other issue was scaling. I'm sure those of you who've worked on, on small systems as they've grown have, have noticed this. You always get something wrong, no matter how good your intentions are. And to really be able to kind of, kind of process things quickly, you need to try. And if you get something wrong, then you have to kind of go and rewrite something. And we didn't want to be kind of, trying to scale every single project that we were involved with. Um, and the last thing is tooling, kind of, if you write a quick prototype, you usually leave out things which become really important later, like monitoring, um, good error reporting, good failure handling. Um, I should maybe say some things about failure. So one of the exciting things about operating in Africa is that you and failure conditions often aren't the exception, they're often the rule. So for example, we run some projects in Ethiopia. Um, there's one ISP in Ethiopia, it's state owned, it has no competition. It occasionally goes down for a week um, and you can't connect to the country. So as you can imagine, that makes designing systems to handle that. Um, well, designing systems to handle that is, can be tricky. So in response to these challenges that we encountered um, during text alert, we created Vumi. And Vumi is the, a messaging engine which attempts to um, provide a reusable framework to separate kind of the social applications that we're trying to build from the connectivity to mobile operators. And yeah, and to kind of give us the tooling and kind of production readiness that on all of our projects without having to, to rewrite it. Um, uh, Vumi is a Swahili word. It means something like distant roar or buzz or hum um, or roll of thunder. It's a kind of a, a distant noise. So architecturally, this is kind of what Vumi looks like. If you look on the left, you can see a cell phone. So you can imagine someone kind of holding a cell phone in their hand. Um, if they send us an SMS that goes to a cell phone tower, eventually that comes to one of our servers. Um, you can see that labeled transport. So transport is what we refer to. Uh, it's a twisted process that um, sends and receives messages to a network operator or to an instant messaging service. Um, the next column is another set of processes called the, which we call dispatches. Um, they're routers. They decide where messages go, usually based on the telephone number they're being sent or received from. Um, and then lastly, on the right, we have really the, the, the important part. So the left-hand side is mostly plumbing. Um, on the right, we have ap applications. So these are ideas that these are reusable things that um, can be plugged into different transports and different dispatches. Um, yeah. Cool. So, the, the way that things are architected, we use kind of horizontally scalable workers. So we write workers using Twisted, um, the asynchronous kind of event framework. And then if we need to handle more messages, we fire up more processes. Um, yeah, and I really want to say thank you to all of the people who've worked on software like Twisted that we use um, and, and Python. Um, having the infrastructure to build things on um, really helps. All of our messaging between these horizontally scalable processes happens over RabbitMQ, uh, which is a messaging bus. Um, so it just sends messages backwards and forwards and workers can subscribe to receive messages which they process. If workers fail to process messages, they go back onto the queue and get reprocessed later. Um, for data storage, we use 
Um, we use React, uh, which is a, a distributed key value store. We chose React rather than Postgres because really we, we do want to reach massive scale. Um, so at the moment we have um, kind of say, as I said earlier, about, well, I think about seven, well, we have about seven million people who we've interacted with so far. And Postgres would probably still have been fine for that. But we really would like to be able to reach the point where, as I said, we can speak to billions of people. So, uh, we maintain Reacosaurus, which is the twisted React client. Um, it's pretty much a direct port of the of Basher's React client. Um, so if anyone wants something fun to work on, we'd really appreciate some help maintaining that. Um, so um, some of the things that we built with Vumi. Um, in Kenya, we did a project called CC Niamani, which was um, an attempt to curb election violence in Kenya. So in Kenya, in not the most recent election, but the election before, there was a lot of violence in townships. And there was the impression that this violence was triggered by, well, that mobile phones were enabling this violence. So what would happen was someone's house would get burnt down. A few local people would decide that it was, say, the members of another political party's fault. And then they would SMS all the day. So they would be angry, obviously. Someone's house had just been burnt down. I think we'd all be angry. And so then they would SMS their friends and say, it was these people's fault. And then more people would be angry and violence would break out. So CC Nemani was an attempt to counteract this by introducing sort of peace officers also with mobile phones. And the job of these peace officers would be that if they, would, if they received such a message or they had the impression that violence was flaring up, they would describe the situation to um, people at the NGO's head office who would then attempt to carefully craft some sort of response, which would also then be disseminated via SMS um, through the kind of peace officer process, um, well, via the, the peace officers. So as you can imagine, you need to respond quickly. Um, I mean, you're talking about kind of violence breaking out on a time scale of hours. Um, and ideally, you want people to, to kind of calm down and think a bit about things more on a scale of minutes. Um, so CC Nemani was a system we built to allow kind of p that feedback to reach the NGO and for messages to be sent back out again afterwards. Um, and the last Kenyan election had less violence. Um, it's a bit difficult to have a control to measure against, but um, we also do, um, we're part of the Wikipedia Zero project. So Wikipedia Zero is zero rated, well, the main Wikipedia Zero project is zero rated access, so that's free access to Wikipedia um, over um, internet on mobile phones. Um, we do Wikipedia text, which is um, accessing Wikipedia over SMS um, and instant messaging. And that's to just kind of make things, well, lower, lower the barrier to, to entry even further. Um, so speaking of lowering barriers to entry, after we had created Vumi, there was still some, some problems. Um, and the one was that just the, the biggest problem really was just that there were too many projects um, and setting up um, and we'd really hoped initially that Vumi would be a tool that other nonprofits could use um, but it, yeah, it turns out that there are, there are difficulties. So one, connecting to network operators is, is expensive. Um, running Amazon EC2 instances is expensive and Really, just we don't have enough people to solve all of the world problems ourselves. Like, not a surprise, I guess. Um, so, this led us to make Vumi Go, which is a hosted instance of Vumi. And the idea is that by providing Vumi Go, we can provide a way for people to help themselves. So, we run the Amazon EC2 instances, we deal with connecting to the network operators, and we provide people with a hosted service where they can come along and build their own applications to fulfill their own needs. Um, and usually they know better than we do what those needs are. Um, so for example, Vumi Go has a simple survey builder, um, which we call a dialogue application. Again, to remind people that you're not asking a bunch of questions and getting some anonymous feedback. This really, we want people to really think about this as a dialogue between themselves and um, the people that are kind of speaking to them over their mobile phones. And 
Then we also wrote a, a JavaScript sandbox so that um, a lot of young Africans um, can code, are very excited about coding, are technically savvy. And we really wanted to provide a way for an excited young African who's one of, one of the many African innovation hubs to be able to come to Vumigo, write their application in JavaScript, and, and run it. Uh, I'm sorry it's JavaScript, but that's what most people know. Um, I'm hoping to build a Python one when I get a moment. Um, so we're kind of reaching the end of time, but just a quick kind of where we are now. So Vumi, Vumi Go has now interacted in the last um, year with um, a total of 7 million people, up from 1 million at the start of the year. So it's seven times, seven times as many people as we had before in the last six months, which is good. Uh, we've uh, sent and received 40 million messages. Um, that's up from 12 million previously. Um, we also registered voters in, in Libya. We registered 16% of the Libyan population of SMS and USSD to vote. Yeah, so that's 16% of the total population, um, which I, I, was really, I was really proud that we could be involved with that. Um, in South Africa, we ran election monitoring. Um, we, yeah, uh, what is interesting about the South African election monitoring campaign is that we really, it was the first time we were really running a big project over lots and lots of different sort of channels of interaction. So that used SMS, USSD, Twitter, and Mixit. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Mixit is, it's a big instant messaging network in uh, Southern Africa. Um, I think it has about 50 million users. Um, in Nigeria, we ran an agricultural awareness campaign, just making people aware of the importance of agriculture. Um, there, people could download a ringtone from a famous Nigerian musician, and that reached out to one million people. So what next? Um, we're adding lots of APIs, again, lowering barriers to entry, making the system easier for people to use. Um, um, things like, obviously, the technology space isn't static, so things are constantly changing. Um, we're really moving to, well, we're seeing instant messaging move to multimedia messaging, and if you're using WhatsApp, there's, you can send photos, send videos, send voice recordings. Um, we're also actually moving into voice itself. Um, there are many illiterate people in Africa, and if you're going to reach out to them, you need to do so um, by voice. And lastly, um, we're trying to get better at dashboarding and analysis so that we can be sure we're actually having the impact we intended to. Um, we have some bigger plans, um, which we'd really like help with. Um, we'd like to build the African Content Retribution Network, um, because there currently isn't one, and 350 millisecond minimum latency sucks. Uh, next, um, we'd re really like to build a federated instant messaging protocol, so think WhatsApp, but structured like email, so that we aren't all tied into a single provider. Um, yeah, and just in closing, I, um, something that Constance said during her keynote, um, which really, she was speaking about it in a security context, but I think it applies equally to um, the kind of social space. Um, really show that we care, don't accept that things have to be the way they are, and work to change them. Oh, thank you. <laughs>